And what I discovered in Spain was there's a whole culture of this. It's called sobremesa. So sobremesa means over the table in Spanish. And the Spanish, the, this whole four-hour siesta idea that the Spanish have, it's not about sleeping. It's not about being lazy. It's about enjoying food, enjoying company, kind of digesting yourself and your family and your friends over a table. And, you know, let's tie it right into men. Let's tie it right into being a father um, and a businessman and all the things that we have to handle. Um, it turns out that friendship, like anything else, is a practice, right? You have to have ways of doing it that kind of keep it moving, keep it happening. How do you, how do you kind of practice friendship? And for me, sobre mesa, you know, the art of gathering people around a table has been has been a lifelong one and it has it's kind of created texture and long lasting friendships in my life all right fellas i'm here with jeff hamowy which i'm going to ask him about his name in a in a moment uh, but i want to tell you guys a little bit about why we're having this conversation and who jeff is and hopefully where this conversation may lead. Um, and it'll go wherever it goes. But uh, I want to talk about uh, wealth through community. I want to talk about midlife wisdom. I want to talk about reimagining our second half and regenerate, regenerative communities. There's so many things I would like to touch on. Men's feelings that Jeff's doing research on. There's quite a bit. Uh, what I want you to know about Jeff is a couple things here. First, he is married. He has two kids, a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. And why we're having this conversation today is that I, I was at an event called Gathering of Titans where there was a speaker, Christine, and I found out that she was connected to part of building a partner in this um, this uh, modern elder academy. And first of all, I even heard the title and just leaned in because I thought <laughs> that resonates with me. Um, immediately when, when I started hearing about what, what they do and how they operate and how they gather and the purpose of their, their, their academy, I, I thought there are tons of guys in Front Row Dads that would love to hear about this. And so since I've heard about it and talked about it, men have literally responded saying, I've been looking for something just like this. That was their response. And we'll get into what that is here in just a second. But Jeff is a founding partner. Uh, he is a seasoned entrepreneur. He is an innovation and sustainability expert, a regenerative farmer, which I'm curious if you know some of my friends in the space a property developer and writer. And just by that short intro, you can imagine we would have hours of things to talk about. Uh, he's into surfing and music and um, just sounds like such a, a fun human to be around. This is Jeff and I's first conversation, but I have listened to a few of his con that conversations his, he's had. I've read a Forbes article written about Jeff and his partners. And so this is going to be a fun conversation. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. The, the work you're doing is so incredibly important, and I can't wait to dig in here with you. John, I'm excited. Let's let's jump in. Let's start with the name. Um, with, you were laughing like, oh, God damn, how do I say Please. this? Please. Yeah. <laughs> so the name is Syrian, um, but, but it comes, my family actually grew up in Egypt. My father grew up in Egypt, and then they were all exported to um, South America, to Venezuela and Colombia. And that kind of, the reason I tell you that is it kind of sets up my life. I was, I was born in Canada, brought up in Venezuela, Colombia, moved to France, Italy, Spain, and the UK, um, which is where I get this English accent from, and then spent 20 years in California, five years in Baja, California, so Mexico, and now I am in um, between Santa Fe, New Mexico, where MEA has a campus, and Baja, California, where MEA has a campus, and we're, we're setting things up there. So there's been a lot of movement. I'm what they call a third sector kid, um, you know, moving, moving around the world, moving around cultures, seeing, seeing how different types of people manage different types of things. So yeah, that's the name. It's all in the name. When I was reading the Forbes article, mm -hmm. there was a little piece in there that, that caught me. It said, um, it, it, quote, 
the idea he suddenly remembers is rooted in the bad boarding school food he found a way of coping with in his, in his childhood in England. He negotiated with the school kitchen to let him cook on weekends. <laughs> dude, can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that, I, I heard that. I'm like, dude, I'm fascinated. At a young age, like this gathering, bringing people together, uh, feels very fitting to what you're doing now. But tell me a little bit about that, man. Take us back. Take us back. Um, there was a guy called Henry Fielding who called English boarding schools dens of vice and iniquity. Um, they're, they're pretty hardcore places, especially in the, the Victorian model, which I grew up in. Um, I think they've gotten better since then. But yeah, it, it was kind of prison school prison food vibes um and i'd I'd learned to cook as a kid so i was like dude let's let's pull let's pull food from the kitchens and and move it into the 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 prefects the older kids this is very harry potter by the way um in your mind have harry potter and you get the kind of idea um so i got i got this food i started cooking it and there was all kinds of conditions i had to feed some of the older kids and i could bring my friends together the reason the story is kind of interesting is it started a lifelong practice. Um, I convene people with food. Um, and, you know, I, as, a, as a kid at university, we did something called Sunday Lunch Club. And it was pretty formal. Eh? We had like eight of us, suits, ties. We had a special tie that we all wore. Um, again, this was in the UK. So that's the kind of thing that they like to do there. Um, and each week we'd invite eight guests, so 16 of us, and it was like a potluck lunch. Everyone would bring something. So we were all broke as hell, but someone would bring the wine, someone would bring the meat, someone would bring the whatever, the cheese and the port and the cigars. I'm not kidding, it was, it was very funny. We'd kind of go into these super long Sunday afternoons and they were themed and we'd have these long discussions. And there is a cadence to bringing people together. There is a cadence to community and bringing people together in community that is fascinating. When I moved to Spain, I lived in Spain for four years in Mallorca. Um, I was doing some private equity work there and some um, foundation work with a guy called Stefan Schmidt-Heine, who was Europe's richest man at the time. And that's how I got into this whole sort of sustainability field, um, kind of investing um, on his behalf into kind of sustainability projects and businesses. And what I discovered in Spain was there's a whole culture of this. It's called sobremesa. So sobremesa means over the table in Spanish. And the Spanish, the, this whole four hour siesta idea that the Spanish have, it's not about sleeping. It's not about being lazy. It's about enjoying food enjoying company, kind of digesting yourself and your family and your friends over a table. And, you know, let's tie it right into men. Let's tie it right into being a father um, and a businessman and all the things that we have to handle. Um, it turns out that friendship, like anything else, is a practice, right? You have to have ways of doing it that kind of keep it moving, keep it happening, how do you how do you kind of practice friendship? And for me, sobre mesa, you know, the art of gathering people around a, a table, has been has been a lifelong one, and it has it's kind of created texture and long lasting friendships in my life. Mm. There you go. Stop now. When you think about <laughs> setting up energetically those types of gatherings, mm. do you have some basic principles that you operate with? Um, like, I'll give you an example of what leads me to that question. Uh, I have this, okay, first of all, I've been craving a round table in my house for the longest time. And, and two years ago, I finally got what I had envisioned. And I love the feeling of a round table. I often get lost when it's like a rectangular table and there's eight people and then two people start talking. And, but I've been always drawn to this, you know, round one conversation type of table. And I feel like six people is a really magical number too, because when it gets too big and there's, you know, there's like a number, there's a size of the table, there's some energetics to that, that make certain pieces of that very attractive for me. So anyway, I'm curious to how you look at setting up the environment to nurture conversation and how it flows for you. 
Mm. I was as you were talking. I actually wrote a blog on this. I wrote a whole piece on sobremesa, um, but I can't find it in in the in the few short seconds that we have. And I came up with my sort of ton, t- top ten practices. Um, yeah, I, I we can I, find I, that and link to it in the notes. Yeah, I will. I will send it to you. I will send it to you after after we finish chatting. You know. Um, I really love that you started with the table. When, when I moved to Baja with my wife, so myself and my wife, we were running a, an innovation consultancy in San Francisco. We had global offices. We had a, a team of about 30, 40 people, and we were working all the time, traveling, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there was this moment, this kind of crunch moment where... We had two very young children, three and four at the time. Um, and we looked at each other and we were like, what the hell are we doing? There's, there's more backstory to it in terms of what was going on with her. Um, as so very often happens, a lot of the burden of young children had sort of fallen on my wife because I was getting to travel. I was getting to, you know, get my sleep while she was both working and looking after, after young children in our home. So we, we jacked it in and we drove down to Baja. Um, we were literally going to just go and build a surf house, take a sabbatical, reframe, reimagine, and then decide where the hell we were going to go next. And we ended up at the at MEA, at the Modern Elder Academy. I was in the very first week. I was in the very first cohort. And so we decided to stick around. I, I started volunteering. I started sort of hanging out with Chip. Chip Conley was one of my partners there. And Christine, as you mentioned, Christine Sperber. And it was kind of amazing, like shedding all possessions, houses, cars, everything. We went down in a truck in a Toyota Tacoma, packed to the gunnels. And that's all we had. Um, and the very first thing I bought, John, and now this, this kind of brings us back to your question. The very first thing I bought was a table. I bought a massive table because I realized that, that without it, I couldn't bring people together. So I bought this huge table with like 12 chairs. And my wife was like, dude, you're a complete nutcase. What are you doing? But sure enough, we became the convening spot, right? Our friends, people that we met surfing. It, it literally allowed us to build instant community. A um, couple of other really simple, quick rules that I can remember off the top of my head. Cadence. Um, these things work if people can predict when they happen. So it's like, look, we do this every Sunday night or every other Sunday night. And, and then it's like, okay, I can put that in my calendar. I can start to rely on it. Um, the next rule is no assholes. Um, which sounds kind of obvious, but you'd be kind of <laughs> surprised at how often, you know, we get wrapped up with ourselves in our lives. And it's just like, just edit those people out. Only invite people that you're excited to have at the table and that you want to kind of be with you um, repeatedly. Because these things do gain a momentum. And if, and if you let one in, it's hard to then kind of eject people out. So I guess actually, while I've always been pretty generous in terms of inviting people being careful of the container being careful of who you let into your sort of sobremesa meetings is is interesting um and then have a core group have a core group who understand what's going on um if you're the host of something like this it's a lot of money and a lot of work um for some people neither of those things are a problem for some people they are I was able to do this as a student, not because I was rich, but because I kind of created rules that allowed my friends to sort of chip in and bring food and, and support. Make, make the structure work for you so that it's sustainable. And the two things you need to kind of think about are, can we co-share? Can we all bring food um, so that I don't have to cook everything? So it's not just money, it's effort. And then at the end of the meal, let's all clean up together. I know it sounds weird, but if you're left every Sunday night or every other Sunday night cleaning up after 20 people, it's a pain in the dick. You know it's what I mean? It's so right. It's yeah. so right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't know it's how the deal. way we got onto this. And I'm so thrilled that we did because this is like a lifelong passion of mine. And it's so fun. Um, music. Well, clearly, right? Because it, it goes back to you as a kid. Like yeah. you did this. 
And I was like, oh, I see what you're doing now. I see what you were doing as a child. And when I see the bridge between those two things, Mm -hmm. like that natural experience, like, okay, so here's, here's something about me, Jeff. When I was younger, probably, and I don't know what age, but let's say between eight and 10 ish, probably. I remember vividly having, um, the adults sleeping and I, and I, I say adults cause I don't remember if I was at my house or a friend's house. It might've been a friend's house, but I remember building menus and like tidying up the house and making food and like wanting the parents to wake up and like blow them away with how we hosted them. Like how we, the hospitality, I wanted them to be like, you cleaned, you cooked, you, <laughs> right? Like I wanted the praise and I wanted them to feel happy and, and welcome and all. And so when I found my career in my late twenties, as my title was a sales promotion manager for this company, I was an executive for this company. And I would, I was literally the host for hundreds of people on big incentive trips. I was taking 400 people to Italy at a time and hosting them for a week. And my whole role was to design uh, events that would motivate people to succeed and then to reward them when they did. And I was the host. I want, but right. And I would, I was, I was in charge of gift giving and setting the room and creating the culture. And dude, I loved it. I remember the minute I found myself in that role, I was like, dude, this is what I've been in training for since I've been eight years old. Like this taps into every part of my core uh, that I love to do that I would do for free, you know, all day long. And so when I see that in a person where it shows up as a kid and then they reconnect as an adult, ah. That's, that's fantastic. What alignment, what attunement to your inner child, to your soul. I, I just love the way you're framing this. I love it. And, and I've been aware of it both professionally and personally my entire life. You know, one of the things, one of the exercises that we do at, at MEA, one of the things that we do with these thousands of people that have come through is we... We, we help them think about what is your mastery? What is this sort of gift that you've had your entire life? Mm-hmm. And the word yes. that you used, the attune word, is the word that is, is vital. How do you attune to that, right? So often our gifts are kind of secondary. You know, I, I often think of superheroes, right? If, if you're Superman, you've got like the full spectrum of the gifts, right? You can fly and lasers come out of everywhere and, and you're in, in, you know, whatever. And there's some, some superheroes who've got really crappy gifts, like they can just hear really well or run really fast or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, dude, that just seems a little unfair. But, but what's interesting about these gifts is if you kind of embrace them, if you embrace that superpower, it, it actually can, can take you to places that it, that no one else can go to. So for example, I'm a, I'm a great facilitator and I say that with no humility whatsoever, but we just don't have time to, to kind of bullshit each other. I really enjoy facilitating, right? I enjoy bringing people together. I enjoy conversation. I enjoy that sort of, that sort of work. Being an okay facilitator is very different from being a great one. If you can do something really well, you can lead as a facilitator. There's a way of leading collaboratively that is very different from leading as that kind of hyper charismatic individual. So if you're good at facilitation, you can lead in a different way. You can think in a different way. You can get creative in a different way that perhaps you couldn't if that wasn't your superpower. I spent my entire life resenting the fact that I wasn't the front of room guy. You know what I mean? I spent my entire life resenting the fact that I wasn't the thought leader, the, the guy that everyone was like, oh my God, you're amazing, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, it wasn't my personality. It wasn't my gift. I, I, I fought against the fact I had like sort of anxiety about that. And as I get older, um, as I kind of come into this second part of my adulthood, and we can talk about that soon, um, I realized, oh crap, no, it's just taken me to all kinds of incredible places. It's allowed me to work on all sorts of amazing things that I would never have been able to do had I just been that super superhero, super leader type of person. You know what I mean? So embracing your gift, yeah. I guess, sounds a bit sort of woo-woo, but, but you get where I'm going. 
hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you know, okay. So the word attunement, which we kind of put an exclamation point on when I was getting your bio there, the music piece came up, which there was a line that said something about an obsession that led to creating a course about music as a practice. Yeah. So talk to that point for a moment because music is a big part of like creating culture in a room it, it, right it creates a vibe for sure yeah. uh, unites people um when language often doesn't yeah. um so much we could say about it but talk to me about how music plays a role in your life and if it happens to tie into mea where we are taking this conversation into the second half great uh but expand on music a little bit yeah, like maybe start with like, what is this course? Yeah, let's yeah. Oh no, let's start with a lifetime of listening to music. Okay, um, it sounds to me, John, that you have. Do you do you have a passion for music? Or do you do you love music? Yeah, maybe not as much as the person who loves it the most. But yeah, <laughs> man, it's all of course. Yeah, I've had a different relationship with it in different seasons of my life, but music's been a wonderful tool for me to access different emotions and connect with people. I have so many memories. I mean, you don't know, you probably don't know this, but in 2005, I started Front Row Foundation, which is a charity that helped kids and adults who have a life-threatening illness to see the concert of their dreams from the front row. Mm. So I've always enjoyed creating those moments for me and my friends, but also for other people. Mm. Yeah. So yes, of course. Right. But and continue. And, t- tell me more about it for you. And even as a curator of experiences, you've, you've understood how music can shift a mood and shift, shift the way people feel, right? Okay. So, since I was 18, again, a lot of these habits have, were formed when I was a kid, right? They're like kid habits. I started making um, a monthly playlist. Every month. Every month. Playlist, playlist, playlist. Um... And professionally, um, it never had any impact in my life whatsoever. It was always a personal practice. Um, and, and even calling it a practice is a stretch. It was always just something I did. It was kind of my way of goofing around. I enjoyed it. I love music. That's it. The end. Um, fast forward to MEA. So what is MEA? MEA is a midlife wisdom school. MEA is a place where people come... I'm going to give you a bit of background on MEA and then I'm going to slot music into it. Otherwise, Please, this yes. all seems a little... I was going to ask you that anyway, yeah. It's like, what the hell is he talking about? Why is he working on music? Um, so MEA, the concept behind MEA is really simple. Um, in 1905, we would live to around 55 years old, okay? By now... Um, our average life expectancy is around, if you reach 50 in America, you can expect to live well into your 80s. Um, If you do the basic mathematics, in the last 100 years or so, we've gone from adulthood being, you know, let's say 20 to 50, to being 20 to 80. We've we've doubled adulthood. And in doubling adulthood, we've given ourselves this second adulthood, right? So the idea behind MEA is is super simple. It's like, hey, if you've got all this extra time, and if we're living longer, and society really hasn't acknowledged this idea that we're living longer, how about we create a place for people to take a pit stop, a midlife pit stop, and say, did the decisions I made as a 20-year-old do the decisions that I made as a 20-year-old still serve me as a 50-year-old, as a 40-year-old, as a 60-year-old? Our average demo is around 52 years old, um, and we men and women, just for the record. And so what we do is we bring people together in, in cohorts week by week, um, and we, we provide them with all... It's like a, a buffet, talking about food, all these things time together, right? We provide them with a buffet of new ideas, new thoughts, new ways of thinking about aging, about themselves, about their mindsets, about what might come next, so that then they can go into their second adulthood, let's call it a second adulthood, in a more conscious way. Who do I want to be? What do I care about? What, what the hell is it that I actually value and want to do? 
And a lot of the a lot of the sort of stuff that we talk about, a lot of the practices that we share are they kind of range from, you know, super practical, how do you do X, Y, and Z? How do you ask a question? How do you listen better? To perhaps more contemplative practices, right? How do you pay attention to yourself? If you want to shift your life, how do you pay attention to what it is that you like and don't like in your life? How do you pay attention to how you feel about something? How do you create space for yourself to get more grounded, more connected? Um, as, as, a, as a guy, there were two things I did. I don't even know if it, as a guy is a good qualifier. As a human being, there were two things that I did that I kind of never took seriously. The first was surfing. I surfed every day for, for sort of, you know, most of my 20s, and, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. And the second was listen to music. And on both of them, I was, I was a little dismissive of it, John. I was like, oh, this is just the way I goof off. Right. This is I, it's kind of a waste of time. And it's if I was a more productive human, I would probably spend less time in the ocean and less time listening to music and more time, you know, making shit, making, you know, at work. And what I as I was kind of at this academy and as I was listening and learning from a bunch of teachers, different types of people, what I really started to appreciate was that the bleeding edge of wellness, the bleeding edge of how people care for themselves is starting to shift away from this idea that it's like, no, no, you must meditate, sit with your legs crossed and, you know, chant. And it's, it's sort of opening up to this idea that, gosh, these fundamental practices like exercise, like music, connect us to some really powerful human um, needs. So there's a book, um, called Blue Mind, where the author looks at the power of the ocean um, in terms of wellness, in terms of mental performance, physical performance, and so on and so forth, how immersing yourself in the ocean can change, can change you. So, oh, maybe surfing actually was a practice. Maybe surfing was something that was important to keep me level, balanced, healthy, mentally, physically, and so on. And when I found that out, I was like, well, shit, maybe music is a practice, right? Um, and so I started doing some research. I, I, I brought together two or three friends. Um, one, one's this sort of super dorky um, Goldman Sachs researcher friend of mine who was like, he's just like a quant, right? And he's like, okay, I'm going to do all the research and find out all the things about music and, and see if it's been proven to have these kind of health benefits and sure enough, he found top 10 health benefits. Again, I'll send you the top 10 health benefits of listening to music. And the research around the impact of music on our cognitive health, on our physical well-being. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, how music can kind of jog memories, create community. Um, music literally moves us together, right? Um, as we're all listening to music together, we, we get kind of um, yeah. syncopated and we adjust together. Music can help us perform better physically. Um, if you're listening to music while you're doing exercise, it's been shown that you can do, you can perform better. It improves our pain tolerance. So if you're at the dentist, the reason they let you listen to music is because it actually reduces your, your, either your anxiety or your experience of pain in the moment. Um, this host of benefits, a host of benefits very similar to, let's say, something like meditation. So the course was like, hey, man, could, could you use music and listening to music consciously as a way of meditating, as a way of practicing, connecting, grounding to yourself? And the answer was resoundingly, absolutely yes. So we did that course. We had all kinds of people, amazing people, um, musicians, um, performers, and so on and so forth, talk about how, how music, how they use music and how, how music has impacted them. And we had a guy called Daka Keltner um, from UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, who basically shared like, yeah, absolutely. If you use these things intentionally, like music, it has all these physiological and psychological benefits that you can you can take advantage of. I, the only and the closing thought on all of this is 
There's a difference from having Spotify in the background, just like running in your, your home, your office or whatever, and sitting down with a piece of music and paying attention to it. So you like anything, for, to get the benefit, you kind of have to get into it. You have to focus on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I, I feel like so much of that has, has got to do with the fact that vibration, energy, frequency um, matters so much. Yeah. You know? And I think that's why humming you know, or oming can affect your nervous system. Right. It, it, there's just so many things that the vagus nerve. Right. And yep. I, I, I've been I have all these little bits of information that I've been gathering over the years. And I think what's really cool is you go all the way back to when you're a kid. And a lot of it we knew because we were totally in our body and maybe we hadn't adopted the blueprint or the program that said, I'm not enough. I need to go perform. I need to do these things. But if we're just allowed to listen to our body and we're just in the flow of life, then there's a lot of wisdom in that. I, I, I think it's wonderful to be able to go back and look at our childhood. I think it's clearly been a theme of our conversation, but cool. I love that you were doing that, man. I, it makes me, uh, when, I, when I see my kids being totally lost in the moment, and I get angry at them sometimes because they're playing so much at home that they're not vacuuming the floor or setting the kitchen table or taking a shower or going to bed or whatever, but they're so lost in play. They're just giggling and wrestling and being kids. And I'm like, I, you know, I feel shame sometimes when I'm like, you know, cut it out. Stop having fun. Stop being, you know, cause really what I'm saying is like, stop being in the moment. Stop, <laughs> stop doing the very thing that is the most important thing to do in life. You know, and, and, and go do these other things that I think make you successful as a human. And so I won't be a shitty dad and you, you'll be a successful human. Like, I mean, I have this internal wrestling match constantly because I can also argue for why some structure and discipline and why brushing their teeth is a great thing. And, you know, like going to bed is a healthy thing. Like, it's always a yes and. It's always, it's, I can't even think of the last time it wasn't a yes and. But to have that wisdom available to us that there's, if we can also capture the beauty and like when our kids are just being kids, mm -hmm. that is where they truly are my, my greatest teacher, you know? Do you feel that too with you, you know, being a father of two young ones? Like, do you see that and wrestle with that yourself? You know what, you're, you're hitting on so, so many important points. I, I kind of wish we had more time. <laughs> time you talk about my <laughs> no man i know vibration frequency and energy in music um the medicinal powers of music the healing powers right these sound bowls all of these sort of ancient traditions that people are tapping into right now a hundred percent feel that you know as i was thinking about this podcast this morning as 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 i was preparing to talk with you i was like my my um they say that you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. Have you heard that same statement before? Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So my son got up in a, just a stinker of a mood this morning. He was just, he was a full on shit bag and was, was sort of whining and crying and, and whatever. And you've got to understand, right? My work is around being present and asking good questions and listening well. I've learned so many frigging techniques and, you know, been involved. I'm writing a book on men's feelings for crying out loud, John, and I'm tired. And this stupid kid is being a pain in the ass and I need to get him to school and he's not going to get dressed and I'm and I'm finding myself kind of cutting him short and saying just do it because I tell you to you know what I mean? <laughs> and and as you were talking about your kids playing and you know you're trying to be like hey guys it's it's time to go to bed it's time to brush your teeth or whatever it's like I think yeah. I think we just have to cut, cut ourselves some slack right I, I have no aspiration. Totally, yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. have no aspiration to being the perfect. Yeah, that's a piece of it for sure. Right? Sorry, I'm talking over you because I'm excited. But but what? Well, yeah. I think I think the 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 kind of where it ends up with me is it can all be true at once, right? Um, it can be true that you want to leave them in the moment, having fun, enjoying the thing that they're enjoying, and 
it can be true that you need to put good boundaries and and sort of set them up for success in their lives. And and I kind of and it can also be true that they need to learn that you know if you're a pain in the ass, people aren't going to react well. Yeah, and and I think part of my my kind of my work for me is not punishing myself too much when I I don't react well. You know, it's like the, the it's it's kind of having patience with myself as well. It's like yeah, these things happen. Um, I was tired. I was annoyed. I was frustrated. I, the only the only thing I'm trying to do a little better is to sort of own up to it and say hey. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't react well in the moment. Yeah, the repair. And that's about it. Yeah. You have advice on that? You've done a million podcasts on this type of stuff. <laughs> uh, advice on which part? Like how to handle it in the moment? How to repair? How to deal with your own emotions? Which Which piece? Yeah, I would. I would say all of those things. But I. I would say how do you hold those two things together at the same time and be okay with it? You know how to do better. You sometimes do badly. How how do you handle it with your kids? Yeah. Well, so <clears throat> I look at it like there's the before, there's the during, and there's the after. So when I when I have that situation where I can clearly see there's opposing um, needs. I, I both understand that I want them to play and then I raise my voice and I'm dysregulated and I feel that the system is, is you know, um, dysregulated. The system is dysregulated. I then go back and go, okay, what happened before that? Am I working too much? Am I getting enough sleep? Are they getting enough sleep? Like I try to look all to the, the things leading up to the moment. Can I recognize a pattern? Is this happening always on a Friday? Is it the end of the week? Is it because I've had a drink or, or I've had too much coffee? Or is that always, I always yell at the kids when I've had a third cup of coffee. You know, like, can I see a pattern leading up to something for me or them, right? Either way. Uh, that's one. In the moment, I ask myself, uh, you know, how do I start to recognize when my blood starts to boil? Can I have enough awareness around it to like pre-plan? If, if I start to feel this way, this is what I'm going to do. And then I, I come up with a plan of like what happens in those moments. Mm. How do I, do I step away? Do I tell them, hey guys, I'm feeling really dysregulated. You could probably sense it in my energy. I need to step away for two minutes to like ground myself. How am I going to handle it during the moment? And then the last one is the repair, of course, which is for me, oftentimes, I try to be as plain and simple in the repair. Hey, guys, I lost my shit. I did it because of this. Like I was tired. I was cranky. Uh, I, and I teach my kids like most of my anger comes out of fear. I'm afraid that if you don't go to bed, that you won't get enough sleep. The next day you'll have a bad day at school. Your teacher might yell at you. And then I'm trying to protect you from all of that. So I get scared. But my, the only way I know how to change the situation is by getting angry. I feel like if I raise my voice and get angry, you'll listen to me then. Mm. And then I'll save you from having a bad day the next day. So I tell them that what happens. And my kids actually get it at this point so much that they'll say, like, hey, mom's having a bad day. And then they'll say to me, or about me too. It's not just about her, right? Me, role, either name I could throw in there. Hey, dad's having a bad day. He's, um, he's, 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 he's angry, but I think he's really scared. And here's why. My kids will start saying that now. So they start to see, and that develops empathy and compassion, not just, you know, in all directions in our home, which is beautiful. So yeah, man, I, it's been my work. If you go back, Jeff, and listen to all the podcasts I've done, mm -hmm. you will hear me say that, um, managing my emotional state has been the hardest thing as a dad more than anything. That has been my toughest work. It has been the work where um, I have spent hours and hours by myself with therapists, with plant medicines, with in every way, reading every book I could on nervous system, and emotional. It's one of our pillars in Front Row Dads is emotional intelligence. And the more guys that I got to know over the years, the more I realized how much shame there was in a guy having his shit together publicly, but then behind closed doors, having moments where they would melt down or yell or scream or say something that was out of line. And there was a lot of shame for these grown men who were really successful in their careers and, 
had done a lot of work, but, and they feel like they shouldn't have done that. Not a lot of grace for themselves, not a lot of forgiveness. Um, you know, we're going to have to, I don't know. How does all that land for you, man? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm doing a couple of, so I'm writing this book on men's feelings and I'm doing a couple of teaching weeks next year, men's groups weeks. And I think we should offline about doing one of those weeks together. So just let me plant that seed. That sounds like a lot of wisdom and knowledge that you've accrued over time. How does it land for me? You know how it lands yeah. for me, John, is first of all, and so most importantly, what I love is you're looking to yourself um, for solutions. Um, you're, you're not sort of you're trying to control yourself rather than your children, which is really fascinating. And I think yes. for myself, often that's the trap I fall into. I'll, I'll, I'll just be like, guys, if you just do what I say, you know, everything will work out. So self using language like self regulation, um, pattern recognition. And it's when I talk about like, you know, come to the Academy and we'll work together so to, to work out what are the practices that help you pay attention to yourself, right? Whether it's listening to music, whether it's meditation, whether it's journaling, whatever the hell it is that you do to pay attention to yourself, it's not an abstract thing. It's like, when I'm an asshole, why am I an asshole? Right? That's right. In my relationship with my partner, in my relationships at work, in my relationships with my children. And if you're not tracking that stuff, if you're not trying to work out what are the triggers, what are the things, what are the moments, then there's no way to mend it, right? And if it's always someone else's fault, then you're never going to improve. And that's what's so tough about all of this stuff. It's like, I cannot change other people. I can only change myself. I can only work on, on my side of the deal. I, I, I can't change how you feel. I can't change how you th think except for by the things I do. Um, and so I love that there was no, like, my kids need to do this in, in, your, in your thinking. It was all about what you need to do. Um, so that's, that's part of it. And my, my second big reaction was, like, I think that's also why I'm writing this book about men's feelings. I think that's, that's kind of why I, you know, in doing this work, in watching literally hundreds of men in transition coming through the academy, trying to work out what's the next thing that they want to do, be, um, what's their next purpose, and so on. One of the kind of the major blocks that I was seeing was like, God, men often just don't even know how they feel about things. There's this sort of vicious cycle. If you don't know how you feel, then how can you feel better? If you, don't, if you can't feel better, then you'll never feel better, right? So it's like, could we teach men to feel better, like get better at feeling so that they can feel better? Um, I, f I think that as, yeah. as, the, as some of these big institutional needs, and have you done a lot on the, the sort of the crisis in manhood, John? Have you, have you talked to people in your podcast who are thinking about the sort of crisis in manhood? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. This is constantly coming up. Mm-hmm. So, so we've got the base. It's why we exist, truly. Yeah, there is a there is this crisis, and I think it's a crisis that's being kind of precipitated by the unraveling of a structure that made an awful lot of sense for an awful lot of millennia, right? Which is the role of a man is to protect and provide. Um, and then once that role becomes less and less relevant in the world, once. Uh, women are better qualified and, you know, doing better at school, doing better at universities, doing better professionally, it calls into question that role. And I think a lot of what we're, what we're struggling with is the loss, what we've lost. Um, the flip side of that is if your role is to protect and provide, feeling stuff is super unhelpful. The way things feel is super unhelpful because protect and provide usually means killing things, right? Um, so if we can move away from that and move into, okay, well, we, we no longer have to kill things to be men and prove ourselves as killing people, 
we can actually, we're now allowed to feel in the world. It's okay for us to have feelings. I wonder, to me, that's what's kind of interesting in all of this. I get what we're losing, but what are we gaining on the other side, right? What could, could it be that, that in being allowed to feel and to feel better, you okay there? Um, we could create lives that feel better in our families. I think a lot of what you talk about is how do we feel better in our families as fathers, as partners, and so on. But also businesses that feel better, right? If it doesn't have to sort of match this kind of, this paradigm. God, what would a business that feels better look like? So that's kind of the gold for me in all of this. It's like, wow, if I can pay attention to how I feel, I might be able to feel better. If I can feel better as a man or as a woman, frankly, I can feel better at home and at work. And that's pretty interesting. I have a couple of thoughts that pop up as we Go. talk about this and we should totally do another show all about men's feelings. Pretty I think nice. that would be great when the book comes out. Let's get, yeah. let's make that happen. Um, but one is that my son ocean and I were watching a show mm -hmm. recently and I, I don't remember it was a, it's a guy, I don't know the title, but he goes out and he, he's living with this tribe and he's surviving off the land and he's trying to learn their customs and this tribe that he's with these men that are, that are, these are the warriors of the tribe who are there to protect the herd yeah. of, of cattle that provide for the family. And one of the points of this, of, of this, um, of the show was to explain that this particular tribe does not show pain ever. Like, and, and he was using the example of like, they, they cut down this tree that had a honey comb in it because they were trying to get to the honeycomb and these warriors were sitting there taking the honeycomb out and they're getting stung by the bees and these, these warriors aren't reacting at all. No reaction. And the, the guy, who, the Westerner who's there filming, doing, and he's like, ow, 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 you know, and he, he's just freaking out with every bite. And he's talking about how from, you know, their training is you never show pain, you never show hunger, you never show that you're tired, you never show any type of weakness at all. And there's a part of me that gets it. Like if that's your life and that's your world and they're adapting and they're, you know, this is, this is live or die day by day. I understand how some of these practices are developed in these rituals and traditions. And I understand. I also understand that as you start to eliminate some of these problems and you create more efficient food sources and perhaps that protection is not your primary goal every day, how maybe learning to in a healthy way, deal with your feelings or show them or express them as all part of perhaps the evolution. Not that I've got it all figured out or I think how all men should be, but I, I think it's fascinating to see um, how and why men have learned to shut down their feelings or not feel and the benefits and how they've been rewarded for that. And also how men use that now that we're talking about feelings, also how they, they can learn to weaponize them or use their feelings and expressing their feelings as forms of manipulation. Like there's unhealthy ways mm -hmm. to, if you just fully step into the feeling realm, how that can become unhealthy, just like everything on, on one, the opposite side of a truth is another truth. Yep. And so I understand that too. And I think that f understanding all the perspectives and understanding how it's a tool and tools can be used for good or for bad purposes. Um, I'm fascinated by this, but the thing that makes me feel so optimistic about the feelings is for my group, when you understand how feelings help performance, that's where I become very interested. Like if you want to perform in a better way as a dad, as an example, um, the best thing I ever did for my family was adjust my work schedule because I was so dysregulated because of my work schedule. I wasn't trying to create better systems and become more efficient so that I could make more money. Although I love that. I wanted to do it because I was so exhausted from inefficient work systems that I was like, quick and short with my kids because I was fucking up the work projects. I didn't have a good, I didn't have a good handle on that. So I was, so understanding my feelings in that way has helped me to not pass forward traumas 
that uh, are unnecessary in my mind. Mm. You know what I mean? So w- w- let me ask you this about, you know, w- when I share all that with you, what's the core of the book with the feelings? Like, what's the message you want to get across? What's the research you want to do? What are the pillars of the dialogue in the feelings space, you know? You know, what first struck me was this model of unfeeling men that you were talking about, these these warriors that just take the stings and they're not allowed to express pain or, or show any kind of weakness. What what really struck me was, I can't remember the name of the movie. It's one of these Netflix movies that's just come out with Chris Hemsworth in it. It's like Extraction or ex- Expulsion. Limitless? No, 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 no. It's it's like a, it's like an adventure movie, and Chris is the guy that is is sort of going... Extraction? In. Extraction, yeah. Rewatch that film with your warriors in mind. Because basically... Yeah, there's, right. there's, you know, there's like a little heart set up, which is like, hey, there's a little boy and Chris is going to save the little boy and his little boy was, has for some reason gone away. Either he's died or they've divorced. I can't remember the, the, the narrative. The, the plot was so thin. Um, and because of this sort of slightly sweet setup, Chris goes and either beats the shit out of or murders like maybe two, maybe 300 people, right? The whole movie is him just going around killing hundreds of people, having the crap beaten out of him. And to your point, he gets stabbed, he gets punched, he gets whatever. And he never complains. And he never, he doesn't feel a thing, man. And he kills people and it's like, it's fine. Chris is just like soldiering on and it's all good. So I don't think we've lost touch with that kind of warrior ideal. You know what I mean? I think our heroes are still portrayed that way. And, and I think part of it is like, oh, crap. If that's, you know, if, it, if, if the win at any price kind of format is, is what I have to engage with to be a successful man, right? If my feelings don't count, and if if what I if whatever I'm doing, whether it's as a business or whatever, winning at any cost, God, what are the impacts of that on your psyche in terms of how your relationships are going, how your business is going, right? What kind of business you're willing to do, if you're willing to win at any cost, because you're just trying to follow the models that have been put out there, right? I, I, I literally, John, I link it to things like, I told you I was a sustainability guy. How much of this type of thinking is connected to the, the state of the world? If it's okay to win at any cost, environmental, social, whatever, and that what is important is winning, getting rich, succeeding, etc., etc., I think being being told that the way something feels is unimportant has has potentially been at the root of some of our destructive tendencies as a species. I know that sounds really dramatic, but that's kind of what I'm trying to winkle towards. It's If the way something feels is not important, like your warriors, like Chris Hemsworth, then the way you parent is unimportant. The way, you know, the way your parenting feels is unimportant if you get the result. The way your relationship feels is unimportant. The way your business feels is unimportant. And I just, I feel like we are, and I think we are at a moment as a society where we can start to unpick these things and say, is that true anymore? Does that need to be the way it is? And if it isn't true anymore, and I believe it isn't true anymore, what are the benefits of having a life that feels better? I think your podcast is all about that, right? Um, I think men's groups that you're mentioning in these communities, we didn't even touch on regenerative community. I can't believe it. Um, I know, I know. <laughs> but being in community. But I, you know, it's, I, get my, I, I get in this place, Jeff, where it's like I... I could, I used to do this. I would take a hard right turn, you know, and I'm like, I want to get to this subject matter. Yeah. But I have let, I've, in my years of doing these podcasts, I'm like, I'll come back to that. That's great. Let's, yeah. let's come back. It was an intention. It was probably my third. In, yeah. So there's so much here. Oh, man. 
Um, I want to get into the relationship with your dad at some point. Oh. I want to get into more of your your ph philosophies as a parent. Um, I want to get to. I want to know how you've gotten to know yourself in the second half. So I'm bookmarking all these things for for a future conversation. Let's let's just let's just come back and we won't try to squeeze it here at the end. Yeah. So I, I know you've got to be somewhere. How do you want to land the plane here, man? How do you, what do you, what do you want to say to wrap all this up? Can you, can you summarize it? Come on, a poetic closure, Jeff. Yeah, let's see, let's see how I do. You know what? I think I, let me, let me summarize, you know, in my own journey, learning to kind of embrace my own gifts, my own mastery, the things that I love doing and not kind of be ashamed of them, whether it's music, whether it's surfing, whether it's facilitation, and, and actually using, by paying more attention to them, using them as something that is, that, that can help me live a more attuned life, to use your word, I loved that word. The second part were, that we talked about is, God, how do you pay attention to that? How do you pay attention to how you're behaving, reacting, thinking? What are your mindsets? What are the, the limiting beliefs that you have personally, interpersonally, professionally, whatever, especially as you're aging and living longer? And that's really what MEA is about. Take the time, whether it's with us or whether it's somewhere else, to sort of really understand where am I? What do I care about? And how, how am I going to align with the next step, you know, that second adulthood that I've been granted, that I've been given by, by the world? And then I think the last thing is the key to paying attention to yourself is taking the time to care about how things feel. Um, giving yourself permission, especially as a man, to say, does this feel good? Um, you know, I, I, I'll close with a quote. Um, I had the CEO of a big German bank um, in one of my groups a, a, a couple of months ago and really a super fascinating guy, super outwardly charismatic um, and, and successful. And in, in our group, he shared, um, I, I don't know how I feel about anything and I am terrified to find out. Um, so I, this is not a sign of failure, right? This is a societal, this is a societal thing that we, that we are having to wrestle with. And I, and again, like extended life, the fact that we've got more adulthood than ever before, I think we've finally as men been given permission to feel, I loved your, your weaponizing of that, but, I, but there is a light side as well as a shadow side to that, that I think it's worth us exploring. Totally. The end. <laughs> and that's what I think Front Row Dads is going to do. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that's what Front Row Dads is going to do over the coming years, continually do, is to explore both sides. I think one, one thing that I want Front Row Dads to be is not a stand for like, all we do is hunt and kill and war and protect and everything is militant. And also the other side is not like everything is light and bright and airy and floaty. And f like, I, I do see the energies of both of those. And I want our men to have both. I want our men to be capable that if somebody entered their home, they feel like they could protect their family. I love that. I think that it's wonderful, man, to feel strong and capable. I also think that the guy should be in tune with a lighter energy and be able to dance at a party with his wife and be able to cry and express himself. I want him to have access to all these tools. I want him to be a man with range on either side of that spectrum. I want him to be able to utilize the tool that he has access to in any given moment and to see the truth in all those things. Uh, and that you don't have to beat the shit out of some other idea to prove your point. It can be, I want our men to be examples of yes and. Yes, that's a truth, and on the other side of that is another truth, and that they can debate and um, and have di like real deep conversations about the biggest topics in the world, from 
from genders to vaccines to whatever it is that is polarizing for people and do it in a way that unites and that, uh, and that you can have convictions and beliefs and cohabitate with other people that don't have the same beliefs and we'll find a way, we'll find a way to do it and to work in harmony. I think that's what the goal of Front Row Dads is and to do it in a, such a powerful way where we're creators and builders and want to keep aligning with guys like you, Jeff, and what you're doing at MEA to, to create spaces for us all to talk about it and explore. You're doing an amazing job. I want to prop, I want to give you props. I want to give you um, a hat tip and I so appreciate this conversation. I'm very sad that it's coming to an end, but I know you've got a place to be so we can wrap here. Jeff, where can people go to find more about MEA, you and your work with the book? Where do you want to point people to? Yeah, come check us out at the modernelderacademy.com. Um, we have online courses. We have in real life courses. It's worth investigating. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening today. Jeff, thanks for being here. So much love for you, brother. And uh, I look forward to next time. You too. Take good care.